Okay, uh, hello, I'm Jeremy Kone from the Bandai Namco Research. And uh, this is an uh, article from the Transactions of Computer Human Interaction, which was like published almost a year ago. So uh, we can see that uh, many of us have moved our affiliation. But uh, this uh, paper was completed when we were all in the University of Tokyo with working with Jim Rikimoto. So, uh, once again, the title of the work is uh, Design Guideline for Developing Safe Systems for that Apply to the Human Body. So before we go into detail, I'll just let you get a brief idea of what I'm going to talk about. So you see that many uh, HCI researchers apply electricity to the human body for various kinds of applications. But at the same time, we all know that electricity can be sometimes difficult, for, uh, difficult or dangerous or unsafe for us. So it, it, we like require appropriate knowledge to treat them safely, right? So the objective of our uh, paper is to provide some kind of a guide for researchers and to maintain these kind of safety for HCI. And of course, beyond that, uh, we also expect to allow uh, researchers to explore novel usages and methods of these kind of using this kind of electricity and applying them to the human body. So uh, by saying applying electricity, electricity to human body, uh, let me talk about what I mean. I, I'm not saying, I'm just saying electric, electrical stimulation here. We actually ch kind of cover other kind of uh, electric signals, sort of like uh, imperceptual things, like used for uh, transmission and things like that. So it's kind of like where an artificial electric current or a field that are applied outside from the body to inside the body. And of course, like, we do not like cover techniques that uh, measure the electric potentials from the body, like EMG or EEG. So uh, why do you have to talk about this and what's so interesting about it? Well, you see that the human body is really a kind of an electric machine, right? The, so like the human body utilizes like electric potentials for many body functions. Uh, for example, it, it do, does that for like sensing or actuating muscles and things like that. And of course, at the same time, the human body has many electric char characteristics. For instance, it can work as a kind of a resistance, it can work as a capacitor, an antenna, or even a power source. So, um, we see that many HCI researchers have utilized these kind of unique electric char characteristics and have applied them for various kinds of applications in the field. But once again, yes, uh, we do require a broad knowledge regarding these kind of electric safety. So, what can happen is like, if you really have a specific uh, expert, uh, expertise and expertise, yeah, it can sometimes be dangerous because it cannot be enough. So I have seen that some people discussing their safety, but you see that with some kind of their uh, incorrect evidences. So like, you can't always say that A is safe because B is safe. Yeah, well actually, it is a good idea to compare your work with prior work. I actually recommend to do that, but you have to understand what you can compare. So you see that there's several conditions that have, be, that have to be common among them. So you see that wrong understandings and difficulty for understanding can actually disturb the opportunities for using these kind of techniques for researchers. Okay, so let's look at some examples here. Uh, actually, for the paper, we have done a survey for this, but yeah, I'm not gonna talk uh, all about it, so I'm just going through a few unique ones. So you see, I think uh, you all know about electrical muscle stimulation, EMS. It's, a, it's been used for various uh, ACI research recently. And um, of course, electricity is also used for ha haptics. So the uh, right one, the Tesla Touch and the Volvo are quite unique examples where you get some uh, f uh, these kind of AC frequencies into your body with a slightly high voltage. Well, people might sometimes be afraid of get, getting these kind of voltage into your body, but they're doing really well to maintain their safety as well. I think all of you get to know why, why it is safe from my talk today. 
And another example which uses even higher voltage as sparkle, which was presented in Guide 2017, uh, they actually used like almost 12.75 kilovolts, which is very high, but also that, that can be used very safely as well. And another example here is like where there's many actors on the face and they stimulate the optic nerves to hack your vision. And of course, this can be maintained uh, safely as well. So uh, I'll go through a little bit about the safety knowledge and the liter literature as well. So there are various kind of parameters that we must consider to do this. For instance, the current, which is the most important thing, and frequency, the path where they go through, and the part, um, which part of body you're using, and sometimes the voltage. Actually, the priority of discussing voltage is quite low here. And so you can see that there's the safety criteria differs depending on the objectives and parameters used. So um, this is quite a famous uh, figure from the IEC, and you can see that uh, there's a perception threshold at 0.5 milliampers, and this is one of the lowest value uh, which can be used as a guide, I think. So if you stay under that, it's almost always safe like that. But, um, well, you must note that this figure only co covers uh, things that are using fifth, uh, quite low AC frequencies, like uh, consumer oil power supplies. And it o also only covers like when the current passes through the left hand to the right. So you must also consider the path where the, the current goes through, and there's also a, a table about this from the IAC. And so people might think that, you know, having current passing through your left hand to the right, across your heart may be dangerous, but it, it can be dangerous, but it's rather more dangerous when the current passes through your heart uh, vertically. And there's knowledge for this kind of what way the current passes through. And another thing is uh, about the frequency here. So uh, this is these figures that are extracted from uh, a paper presented in 1972. Yeah. So you can see that the right man really suffering from some kind of this electricity. So what have they done in the past was like con uh, changed various various kinds of parameters and observed how the human actually perceives these kind of currents. So. By these kind, uh, thanks to these uh, participants, we now know that uh, we, the, how we perceive the current de uh, depending on what kind of frequency we're using. So we get here, we get to know that uh, if the frequency gets higher, more difficult the current get current is perceived. So if you use a higher frequency, it can be a little bit more safer than using low frequencies. So uh, we'll, by like following these kind of uh, literature from various kind of fields, we come to a guide here, and I'll, I'll give you some guides to, to what to consider when we want to design these kind of things. So uh, we think about three levels here. So once again, it is really a good to re refer to prior work and related work, successful works. Uh, you can go up to related work and uh, refer to values from them, but it's really important to uh, not to stop that. So you must also make sure that you're using the same kind of path and the circuit model for it. Actually, in the paper, we categorized uh, uh, the circuit models into seven, and yeah, you, you must make sure what kind of the paths that the current goes through and make sure that you're using the same thing before you go to consider the quantitative values here. So you know, it is important to consider these kind of parameters, but yeah, I'm not going to uh, go through the, all of the uh, actual values here. It's gonna take hours, so yeah, please see the paper for the actual values here. So uh, yeah, so must talk about the responsibility of this work, yeah. So this paper is actually based on uh, 
various kind of international standards and prior successful works. So we, we didn't actually do some kind of a new experiment. So we do not provide, provide a com complete new uh, safety criteria here. So the, our contribution is like where we organize them and provide a guide for them. And like another thing that we, an limitation that we must note is that the, is, you see that the effect of the continuous and long-term exposure is still unknown. I mean, if you use, uh, uh, apply a specific signal for a week or a month or a year, we, we still don't know what that can happen. So, uh, therefore, you see that the paper can only cover, cover a little bit more temporal shocks or heat effects here. So, uh, let me just talk about typical hazards that we might face. Uh, well, actually, it's quite difficult to get these kind of information because, uh, you know, that we only get uh, papers accepted if, it, if, we would go, if, we, if we're doing well, right? So it's really difficult to get to know what kind of accidents have happened. But I'll just introduce some of them, that which I know. So they're, they're both regarding to some kind of burns here. So what can happen is, like, if you, like, use kind of a dry electrode and the area of the uh, electrode gets really small, the current density really in, uh, increases and which leads to high, high heat and that can cause a burn to you. So it's, if there's not a specific reason, it's usually recommended to use some kind of wet electrodes here. And another risk of the moderate temperature burns that can occur, uh, happen when like you use something for a long time. So if you like use the EMS for a day or something, yeah, you get you get continuous heat for all the time and that can lead to a slight burn here. So regarding these things, uh, there's another technique that I would like to introduce here. So this is, these are some examples from the Japanese industrial standards here. It's really good to uh, uh, look up at industrial standards because they, they make a good guide here. And I'll just introduce some of from EMS products in Japan. So actually, in order to prohibit using the device too long, actually it is necessary to put in a timer into your system and to limit the uh, maximum continuous usage, usage for 60 minutes here. And like it is also uh, very good to in put, uh, and, it, and another thing is that you, you sh must like indicate the st state of the output of your system. So you, you can, it is really good to put some LEDs or things like that to notify the users whether the signals are on or off. So I've been like talking about safety here. Yeah. You, you know, so what we mean about safety is like we m mainly focus on like damages or dangers here, but of course like we must also consider maybe pain or uncomfortableness for our experience sometimes. Yeah, uh, it's quite difficult to model these things, but yeah. But in order to uh, handle these things, manage these things, we usually like get asked to get ethical approvals from ethical boards, right? But the thing is. Yes, for like my case, if you write the documents and go to the ethical board, uh, actually you're rather more knowledgeable than them. So what happens is that they only say you must get the format of the uh, document right and uh, you must like treat the personal information as well. That's what you get. So it, you must be careful that you actually must be responsible for the whole safety thing. And yeah, actually this leads to another open question here. So yeah, when you do papers, it is really good or is, is it really enough if we just say we have approval from my vehicle board? Well, it, actually this can work very well in, in my cases, but as I said, you know, ethical boards are not experts, right? So I'm not sure if it's really good to completely rely on this. So in, a, in other cases, like, you know, we can like have a very uh, long section uh, discussing about the safety. So do we have to take a really large space and the papers discuss the safety? 
Well, um, we know that we all have a limited amount of space in the papers, so I'm not sure that if that will be good for the whole time. Well, actually, I don't have a, a complete answer for this. It's an open question. But, uh, yeah, we do believe that there should be a better way to discuss the safety in our like, papers and research. And we do hope that this talk and this paper can perform as a good guideline to start with them. And yes, this is all from me. Thank you. Uh, yes, yeah, so thank you. Hi, Jeremy Cooper, Stock McGill University. Uh, thank you for a really great uh, topic that you tackled here. Um, I'm perhaps asking or suggesting that as one of the outcomes of your work on this, you might provide some sort of uh, checklist or guideline that researchers who are submitting their EMS projects to institutional REBs could say, we follow the guidelines of da 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 da, check, 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 check and it's been vetted by our community as sort of uh, providing sufficient safety standards. Because certainly at our university, uh, the REBs have, as you say, no knowledge whatsoever. Yeah. And as soon as you say use of EMS may cause death, you know, they freak out. And, uh, you know, having some sort of reassuring comments in there as to what has been done by the community and what are the standards to which we have to adhere, I think would go a long way. So I think, you know, you've started the process here maybe one step further in providing here are the canonical guidelines would be a wonderful contribution. Yeah, thank you. I, I do really think about that. Uh, actually, uh, as an appendix of this paper, we have a a really shorter kind of a document that we, that researchers can follow to more easily and to follow for like the parameters. But we haven't actually uh, done uh, made some kind of a checklist. But I do agree that that, that can really do a uh, good work. But uh, yeah, we almost have to get that uh, you know approved from from the com com community uh, to like convince the people in the ethical boards in local affiliations. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Yan Jin Lai from University of Bremen. Thank you very much for doing this work because I also work on EMS. And like a month ago, I just restarted my EMS project and I read your paper. It was very helpful. But um, I have a question, like, even, like, I know the warnings, you should not, should not put, you should not apply electricity on a certain part of the human body. But every time I see these um, electrodes, I still feel scared if I will be instantly do something wrong. And the problem is that, like, from a designer or a computer scientist, that we don't know much about human autonomy. So we don't know where or how human muscle goes. And I'm wondering if you have done something, study about like how, how electricity will go through the human muscle. Like if I to put the same channel of different uh, electrodes on your two legs, will you, will the, the electricity goes to like some important human organs? Uh, so you're talking about EMS, or what, the, actually what kind of path the current will pass through when Doing yes, because we cannot see how the electricity goes when we just apply it. And do you know if the, or do you think there's um, other easier, easier way for us to know about this knowledge, like so we won't make the electricity go to the wrong, wrong part? Like, well, actually, uh, EMS is rather the, one of the easiest things to discuss about because, like, you actually like making a really small circuit on a specific part of your body. So you can actually really easily manage what kind of paths that the electrodes, uh, the current are going through by like, you know, managing the two electrodes. But the thing I think you have concerns about when you use like multiple electrodes and things like that, is it? Yeah. Yes, I yeah, think it's yeah. also a problem. Yeah, so yeah, that, that maybe requires some more treatments, but yes, uh, actually, you see, even though like, in case of EMS, actually, uh, people think that it's quite dangerous, but you see that the use, using, using like really short pulses, even though you see the in, uh, instructions in, for EMS products, you don't allow pass through your current. But we see that, but actually, 
it really doesn't have the potential to damage your heart significantly. <laughs> but, yeah, so, so but, yeah. the, maybe you will say that EMS is still kind of safe for us. If you, you use the right, I don't know, right device, commercial device, they should be safe. I'm sorry? If you use certain um, like commercial commercial device, like uh, uh, the EMS de device already pr produced by the companies rather than you just build your own appliers, so you suggest people just buy the device? Oh, no, no I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that. You, can, you can develop your own thing, but yeah, of course, like using your uh, product thing may be really safe. But yes, yeah, as long as you manage the signals and you get the knowledge to uh, knowledge about the safety about the signals you can just develop your own things and yeah it's about i think it's about the how you manage the uh, places of the lectures and the uh, overlaps of the signals if you use multiple channels and it's yeah it's about how you manage the signals yeah okay thank you okay <laughs> okay um i think it's now time to to again thank all of our speakers